Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum dear students. Our today's session is based on the novel Emma. I have already introduced to you um, to the novel Emma in the previous session. In today's session we would start with the analysis of the text, story and we would do critical analysis of important parts and themes. Before I start with today's session I would like to share a review of the previous session. In the previous session as I have I told you important facts about her early life and her family environment. Issue of marriage with relation to her personal life was also discussed. With this we moved on to Jane Austen as a novelist. Her art of writing and her abilities as a novelist were discussed. Then we discussed Jane Austen as the author of Emma particularly. With this I gave an introduction to the novel Emma. We shared what Emma is about. We also talked about reception of Emma and uh, Jane Austen's other works. Towards the end of the previous session, I shared a list of characters that um, you would come across in the text. Main or major theme of Emma and other important themes of Emma were quickly viewed so that when you analyze the text, you could see how these themes are incorporated and how they develop through the whole novel. With this we come to our today's session. Well, our current session is uh, about the text of Emma. We would start volume 1 of the novel. Since volume 1 is quite lengthy, so we would cover from chapters 1 to 8 in this session. Important happenings in these chapters, that is from chapter 1 to 8 would be covered. We would have some points of discussion by looking critically at what happens, why and how it happens, so etc. Important parts of text with reference to the development of characters, plot and structure would also be analyzed. We would also have some instances to discuss Jane Austen as a writer and her art of characterization. And of course, as we would move through different chapters, we would look at the development of different themes through these chapters. With this, we start Volume 1, Chapter 1 of the novel Emma. This chapter introduces the novel's title character and protagonist, Emma Woodhouse. She is of 21 years and is the youngest of two daughters of her father. At the very outset, we are given details about her very self, her personality and her family. So we are told that her father is an indulgent man while her mother died long ago, leaving Emma to be brought up by Miss Taylor, a governess who fell, who fell little short of a mother in affection. As the novel begins, we find at the outset that Miss Taylor has just married Mr. Weston. Thus, Emma is left alone. After the wedding, she is alone playing backgammon bag with, with her father to please him, as in general he is a disagreeable man. So now, number one, to take the responsibility of the house, and number two, to take the responsibility of the care of her father, it lies on the shoulders of Emma. Then comes Mr. George Knightley, whose brother had married Emma's elder sister. They discuss how Emma will miss the new Mrs. Weston, that is Miss Taylor, who got married to Mr. Weston. While Mr. Woodhouse pities Miss Taylor, absurdly thinking her unhappy to be married and thus separated from the Woodhouse household. During the discussion, Emma tries to take credit for the marriage, claiming that she matches Miss Taylor and Mr. Weston. So what happens through the first chapter is that we are introduced to the main characters, most of the main characters I would say. We are told about their nature, we are told about important traits of their personalities. For instance, about Emma we come to know that she is a 21 years old young um, woman who is the younger daughter of her father Mr. Woodhouse. We are given some clues even from the very beginning of the text where we are told that she takes the credit of uh, arranging the marriage of Miss Taylor and Mr. Weston. Later on it would throw a lot of uh, light on um, the theme of matchmaking and Emma's interest in matchmaking. Well, 
to understand the writing style of Jane Austen and also to understand how she presents and develops her characters, I think it would be appropriate to read some text to have some shared ideas about that. So let us read text extracts from the first chapter to understand the writing style of the author and to get a feel of the novel. I hope you would read the whole text of the novel yourselves. This is the opening text of volume 1, chapter 1. The text starts as so. Emma Woodhouse, handsome, clever and rich, with a comfortable home and happy disposition, seemed to unite some of the best blessings of existence, and had lived nearly 21 years in the world with very little to distress or vex her. She was the youngest of the two daughters of a most affectionate, indulgent father and had, in consequence of her sister's marriage, been mistress of his house from a very early period. Her mother had died too long ago for her to have more than an indistinct remembrance of her caresses, and her place had been supplied by an excellent woman as governess who had fallen little short of a mother in affection. So this is the first paragraph of the text that tells us how in a very comfortable way in with a kind of ease Jane Austen writes and narrates the background of the female protagonist that we are going to meet in this novel. The text continues, 16 years had Miss Taylor been in Mr. Woodhouse's family, less as a governess than a friend, very fond of both daughters but particularly of Emma. Between them it was more the intimacy of sisters. Even before Miss Taylor had ceased to hold the nominal office of governess, the mildness of her temper had hardly allowed her to impose any restraint. And the shadow of authority being now long passed away, they had been living together as friend and friend very mutually attached. And Emma doing just what she liked, highly esteeming Miss Taylor's judgment, but directed chiefly by her own. The rare evils indeed of Emma's situation were the power of having rather too much her own way and a disposition to think a little too well of herself. These were the disadvantages which threatened Eloy to her many enjoyments. The danger, however, was at present so unperceived that they did not by any means rank as misfortunes with her. Well, this paragraph of the very opening um, part of the novel gives us clues about the personality traits of Emma Woodhouse. The author Jane Austen tells us that the evils of Emma's situation were the power of having rather too much her own way. A bit too much of power that she enjoys as, um, as a woman of fortune, as an intelligent woman and as a woman who is living an independent life and who is in control of everything around her. This is what the author Jane Austen presents as a disadvantage of the situation. Why? Because she says that she has a disposition to think a little too well of herself. So, at the very outset of the novel, we are told about the weaknesses of the protagonist. It is also evident from the very fact that she and uh, Miss Taylor, they live as friends and they have a friendly relationship. So, whatsoever advice or whatsoever suggestion Miss Taylor would give, she would listen to it. However, she would do whatsoever she would like to do. So directly directed chiefly by her own judgment, this is one of the reasons that would later on cause her face a lot of problems as we would go through the text of the novel, we would notice all that. Text continues, sorrow came, a gentle sorrow, but not at all in the shape of any disagreeable consciousness, Miss Taylor married. It was Miss Taylor's loss which first brought grief. It was on the wedding day of this beloved friend that Emma first sat in mournful thought of any continence. The wedding over and the bride people gone, her father and herself were left to dine together, with no prospect of a third to cheer a long evening. 
Her father composed himself to sleep after dinner as usual and she had then only to sit and think of what she had lost. So at the very outset of the novel we find Emma in a crisis situation where Miss Taylor as Mrs. Um, Mrs. Weston has left and now it is only Emma who has to not only bear the loss of a friend but also um, the loss of a governess who would take care of the house as well. The text goes as follows. Her sister, though comparatively but little removed by matrimony, being settled in London only 16 miles off, was much beyond her daily reach, and many a long October and November evening must be struggled through at Harfield before Christmas brought the next visit from Isabella and her husband and their little children to fill the house and give her pleasant society again. So Jane Austen as a very, very clever and tactful writer at the opening also tells us about some other characters. We are introduced to Isabella who is the elder sister of Emma. We are also told that she, her husband and her children would visit them uh, on Christmas. Well, dear students, I have incorporated a lot of text from Chapter 1, Volume 1, uh, into our session today. The reason is so that you could have a feel of the text and the writing style of the author, and you, you can get used to independently read the rest of the text of the novel yourselves. So here again is an extract from the text. The text goes as follows. Highbury, the large and populous village, almost amounting to a town to which Hartfield is spite, in spite of its separate lawn and shrubberies and name did really belong, afforded her no equals. The wood houses were first in consequence there. All looked up to them. She had many acquaintances in the place for her father was universally civil but not among one among them who could be accepted in lieu of Miss Taylor for even half a day. So at the very outset again we are given the geographical and the physical background of where they live. It's a small village that is almost like a town now and uh, that is just 16 miles away from London. And the family of highest reputation in the surroundings in the area is only of Mr. Woodhouse. No other equals as such. And there is also no possibility of somebody replacing Miss Taylor in that context. It was a melancholy change and Emma could not but sigh over it and wish for impossible things till her father awoke and made it necessary to be cheerful. His spirits required support. He was a nervous man, easily depressed, fond of everybody that he was used to and hating to part with them, hating change of every kind. So you see Isabella has already left after marriage. Now that Miss Taylor again leaves, this is not bearable for Mr. Woodhouse. He has a kind of temperament where to bear change is not easy for him. Matrimony as the origin of change was always disagreeable and he was by no means yet reconciled to his own daughter's marrying, nor could ever speak of her but with compassion, though it had been entirely a match of affection when he was now obliged to part with Miss Taylor too, and from his habits of gentle selfishness and of being never, never able to suppose that other people could feel differently from himself, he was very much disposed to think Miss Taylor had done as sad a thing for herself as for them and would have been a great deal happier if she had spent all the rest of her life at Harfield. Emma smiled and chatted as cheerfully as she could to keep him from such thoughts but when tea came it was impossible for him not to say exactly as he had said at dinner. Again, an important uh, character trait of Emma that we notice here is that she cares for her father. Despite the fact that she is sad and melancholic at the, the, the marriage and departure of Miss Taylor, she takes care of her father and to make him happy and to provide him a pleasant surrounding, she tries to be as much cheerful as she can so that her father could be cheerful as well.
anyhow this is the time when mr knightley who is um, a close relative he lives nearby so he visits them and the text tells us about who he is and what kind of relationship he has with mr woodhouse and miss emma woodhouse the text runs as follows Mr Knightley in fact was one of the few people who could see faults in Emma Woodhouse and the only one who ever told her of them and though this was not particularly agreeable to Emma herself she knew it would be so much less so to her father that she would not have him really suspect such a circumstance as her not being thought perfect by everybody Emma knows I never flatter her said Mr Knightley but I meant no reflection on anybody Miss Taylor has been used to have two persons to please she will now have but one the chances are that she must be a gainer well said Emma willing to let it pass you want to hear about the wedding and I shall be happy to tell you for we all behaved charmingly everybody was punctual everybody in their best looks not a tear and hardly a long face to be seen or oh, no we all felt that we were going to be only half a mile apart and were sure of meeting every day and in response to this mr knightley says something and the conversation continues in the text as follows and you have forgotten one matter of joy to me said emma and a very considerable one that i made the match myself I made the match you know 4 years ago and to have it take place and be proved in the right when so many people said Mr Weston would never marry again may comfort me for anything Mr Knightley shook his head at her her father fondly replied ah oh, my dear i wish you would not make matches and foretell things for whatever you say always comes to pass pray do not make any more matches i promise you to make none for myself papa but i must indeed for other people it is the greatest amusement in the world and after such success you know everybody said that mr weston would never marry again so as we consider this conversation amongst the three that is mr knightley miss emma woodhouse and mr woodhouse we realize a lot of things नंबर वन एमा इज़ इन हैबिट ऑफ मैच मेकिंग वो हमेशा लोगों के रिश्ते कराती रहती है ढूंढती रहती है किसकी शादी किसके साथ हो सकती है शी कीप्स ऑन प्लानिंग अबाउट दैट द सेकेंड थिंग इज दैट शी इज़ इन हैबिट ऑफ टेकिंग क्रेडिट ऑफ ऑल दीज मैचेस दैट आर मेड सो हियर अगेन शी टेक्स द क्रेडिट एंड शी टेल्स मिस्टर नाइटली दैट फोर ईयर्स बैक इट वॉज शी हु थाट ऑफ दिस मैच एंड इट ओनली टुक सम टाइम टू प्रूव दैट शी वॉज राइट we also notice another thing that um her pride that she takes in this match making and her what she calls the greatest amusement in the world that she takes as a hobby to make matches of people her father is very fond of whatsoever she does so he is um, fond of what she does in terms of match making as well and in um in a way how a very small very young girl would be treated he treats her and says ah oh, my dear i wish you would not make matches and foretell things for whatever you say always comes to pass pray do not make any more matches and in response to this emma says i promise you to make none for myself papa but i must indeed for other people as if it is her responsibility when she uses the words i must indeed for other people it shows as if it is she thinks it is her responsibility being in a superior position to look for matches for people the text continues ever since the day about 4 years ago that miss taylor and i met with him in broadway lane when because it began to drizzle he darted away with so much gallantry and borrowed two umbrellas for us from farmer mitchells i made up my mind on the subject i planned the match from that hour and when such success has blessed me in this instance dear papa you can't think that i shall leave off match making now this is the point where she is taking credit of that she thought in that particular context where they met mr weston about match making of mr weston and miss taylor at this point mr knightley interrupts and he says i don't understand what you mean by success said mr knightley 
success supposes endeavor so what mr knightley says ke kamyabi ka matlab hai ki aapne koi koshish ki ho your time has been properly and delicately spent if you have been endeavoring for the last 4 years to bring about this marriage a worthy employment for a young lady's mind but if which i rather im imagine you making the match as you call it means only you are planning it you are saying to yourself on idle day i think it would be a very good thing for miss taylor if mr weston were to marry her and saying it again to yourself every now and then afterwards why do you talk of success where is your merit what are you proud of you made a lucky guess and that is all that can be said so what we notice is as we have already been told that mr knightley is the only person who would find faults with emma and who would point those out to emma here again we see that he criticizes emma for taking this credit and i think very rationally and very logically he says that emma cannot take credit of all this because practically she didn't do anything well even if she thought of it in her mind and she kept on reminding herself that this would be a good match it does not mean that it is her success yes it can just be a lucky guess that she made and that sh that proved to be true with the passage of time as mr knightley says this emma woodhouse has an argument with him and she says and have you never known the player and triumph of a lucky guess i pity you i thought you cleverer for depend upon it a lucky guess is never merely luck there is always some talent in it and as to my poor word success which you quarrel with i do not know that i am so entirely without any claim to it you have drawn two pretty pictures but i think there may be a third a something between the do nothing and the do all if i had not prompt i had not promoted mr weston's visits here and given many little encouragements and smoothed many little matters it might not have come to anything after all i think you must know how field enough to com comprehend that a straight forward open hearted man like weston and a rational unaffected woman like miss taylor may be safely left to manage their own concerns you are more likely to have done harm to yourself than good to them by interference so they they have a kind of hot argument on this emma believes that uh, though she did not do all to make this a success or she did not do practically a lot but it could not be termed as doing nothing because actually she was the person who provided some chances of meetings of Mr Weston and Miss Taylor and it was she who prompted Mr Weston to keep on visiting them uh, so that he could meet Miss Taylor so what she says is that she soothed little matters to to let it happen however mr knightley again does not agree to this and disagreeing on this he says that a straight forward open hearted man like weston and a rational unaffected woman like miss taylor may be safely left to manage their own concerns so he is of the view that she should not have interfered and a rational logical man like mr weston and a um, very rational woman like miss taylor could have managed it on their own and a very stark kind of criticism that he makes is you are more likely to have done harm to yourself than good to them by interference well we have already understood that emma's father mr woodhouse would always be taking sides of emma as he is very fond of uh, emma so he interrupts and he says emma never thinks of herself if she can do good to others rejoined mr woodhouse understanding but in part but my dear pray do not make any more matches they are silly things and break up one's family circle grievously only one more papa only for mr elton poor mr elton you like mr elton papa i must look about for a wife for him there is nobody in highbury who deserves him and he has been here a whole year and has fitted up his house so comfortably that it would be a shame to have him single any longer and i thought when he was joining their hands today he looked so very much as if he would like to have the same kind office done for him i think very well of mr elton and this is the only way i have of doing him a service 
Mr. Elton is a very pretty young man, to be sure, and a very good young man, and I have a great regard for him. But if you want to show him any attention, my dear, ask him to come and dine with us some day. That will be a much better thing. I dare say Mr. Knightley will be so kind as to meet him. With a great deal of pleasure, sir, at any time, said Mr. Knightley, laughing. And I agree with you entirely that it will be a much better thing. Invite him, him to dinner, Emma, and help him to the best of the fish and the chicken, but leave him to choose his own wife. Depend upon it, a man of six or seven and twenty can take care of himself. So, two things we notice about Mr. Knightley. One, he still disagrees with Emma, and uh, he says that Mr. Woodhouse is right, that... Uh, that Elton can be invited to their place and he can have dinner with them. However, he says that he is a mature man of 26 or 20 years of age, so he can take care of himself and his issue of marriage, and Emma should not interfere with that. However, in a very light-hearted tone, uh, laughing uh, at all this, he says that yes, he can be uh, invited to dinner and he can be served good fish and chicken so you see he wants to um, let the intensity of all this argument fizzle out well dear students i shared a lot of parts of text extracts from uh, chapter one of volume one so that you could get used to what kind of writing style jane austen has and you could understand the main characters as well um, I wish you a smooth reading from here onwards. Um, so far what we have talked about in the light of that, I would like to share a few points that I think are points to ponder. You need to think about these points. Um, as readers, you would have noticed that in the first few paragraphs of the book, Jane Austen has given an appraisal on Emma Woodhouse, who is the female protagonist of the novel. While she is handsome, clever and rich, as the very first sentence of the text tells us, she is still spoiled and self-centered, less concerned with Miss Taylor's new happiness than her own loss of a companion. Austin introduces the reader to the main issue or problem that the novel deals with. The central theme around which the whole plot will be built is established from the very beginning. And what is that? human follies, human weaknesses, and Emma's weaknesses in special and her follies, and that Emma must learn to be a better person with greater respect for others. We also notice the peculiarity of Mr. Woodhouse, who continuously keeps on complaining. He has a narrow view of the world that Emma has come to share. So whatsoever type of character Emma is, maybe partially her family context and background can be held responsible for all that. Well, I said that partially her background, her context, her family environment is responsible for whatsoever she is. Let's see what kind of background or the world in which Emma lives is. It is a world of layer in which she spends time drawing, visiting with friends, or playing games. It is a static and orderly world. There is a little change in Emma's life, and what changes occur? In this case, the marriage of Miss Taylor greatly disturb her. When Emma describes change as when she suggests that Mr. Elton should be married, it is to set things in greater order. So the habit of seeing things in order leads to her habit of matchmaking so that there could be more order in the lives of people around her. And this is maybe one of her flaws. There are certain themes that emerge through the text of this um, chapter. Uh, the themes that are set here are number one human absurdities number two imagination versus reason and number three class distinction well as far as human absurdities are concerned in the previous session I discussed this as a major or the main theme of the novel if you can recall that in the light of that you can look at Emma and her father as examples of this, these absurdities Emma's habit of making matches of people and her father's habit of keeping on complaining about, you see, changes that occur in his life are the examples of this. 
Another very important theme that emerges through the very first chapter is of imagination versus reason. This chapter sets up the opposition between imagination and reasoning, both ironically based on realism. People do find their own mates, but likewise matches are sometimes made by third parties. Furthermore, though it is done very unobtrusively, Austin places before the reader two characters who are quite eligible for marriage, Emma and George Knightley. Equally unobtrusive is the idea of properly established social ranks. The author is careful to make Miss Taylor and Mr. Weston relatively equal in character and social standing. So what we notice is, whereas at one hand the imagination of Emma is at work to um, create matches such as she has done of Miss Taylor and Mr. Weston and such as she is planning for something for uh, Mr. Elton. On the other hand, we see the rationality, the reason at work in the case of Mr. Knightley. He is a representative of reason. He stands for reason in the novel and he always looks at this match making imaginative creativity of uh, Emma as something um, very illogical. Another theme that emerges through this is class distinction. The short talk between Emma and her father about servants, while it confirms Mr. Woodhouse's kindness to others, also fixes the idea of a definite servant class which one enters by birth and remains in as an accepted and honorable position. At the very outset of the novel, we have some idea about Austin as a writer. Um, there are multiple voices in the novel. Emma's vo viewpoint predominates the novel and Austin gives her perspective on nearly every event. But it is not the only perspective. We notice that the novel is told from the third person which gives Austin the ability to critique Emma's own behavior. The character, Mr. Knightley serves, um, the character of Mr. Knightley serves the same purpose. He is the voice of sound judgment and logic in the novel pointing out where Emma is faulty in judgment or in action. Mr. Knightley represents a sensible view of the world, while Mr. Woodhouse, in comparison to him, is unduly occupied with his own health and his own feelings and comforts without thinking about what other people think and even if there is a possibility that exists that people can think differently from Mr. Woodhouse. Dear students, with this we move on to chapter 2 of volume 1. This chapter begins with the story of Mr. Weston, who had married Miss Churchill, who was of a higher social status than he. The marriage proved to be an unhappy one mainly because she lived a life beyond what they could afford. When she died, the Westons had a child whom Mr. Weston sent to live with his late wife's relatives. The child now grown and having adopted the name of those who raised him, that is the Churchill's family, is known as Frank Churchill and he is in constant contact with Mr. Weston, the father. Frank Churchill was a reason of generating curiosity at Highbury. This is what is told to us in Chapter 2 as well. Well, um, in the light of the happenings in this chapter, there are some points to ponder. An important consideration in Jane Austen's all novels is social status, particularly the consideration of social status with reference to marriage. When it comes to Emma, we find this factor very much at work here as well. Part of the reason that Mr. Weston's first marriage failed is that he married a woman who was used to a lifestyle more lavished and more comfortable than he could provide. So we also come to know that um, this is Mr. Weston's second marriage that he has done with Miss Taylor. The theme of social uh, mobility, actually upward social mobility emerges as a strong theme in this um, chapter. Mr. Weston is benefit from, benefited from his first marriage as it socially uplifted his status. However, for his wife, the case is opposite. Since he marries a woman more wealthy than he is, his wife finds it hard to lower him herself to his level and that is why they could not um, carry on in this marriage and the marriage ended up finally. 
Well, um, after reading the first two chapters, if we look at the development of plot and structure, I would say that especially this chapter, that is chapter 2, it prepares the reader for the upcoming chapters. Most of the material is preparatory, which places Mr. Weston and establishes background for Frank Churchill, who will later figure prominently in the story. So what uh, Jane Austen as a writer is trying to do is to introduce all the main threads into the story that would be interwoven later on and would play a significant role in the development of the story. We are introduced to almost all important characters, Frank Churchill being one of, one, uh, of those. Though practically he would appear much later on the scene, um, he, but he would play a very, very important role. So he is introduced here at the outset. The story also details some particular aspects to marriage and courtship. If parents believe that their son or daughter is not marrying well, they can cut him or her off any inheritance. This foreshadows some of the problems that Frank Churchill will have when he wishes to marry. But Mrs. Churchill, that is the daughter of the very woman who cut his mother off, opposes it. This is what we would see happening later on. Again, almost all the important themes are established from the very beginning of the novel. So in this chapter, we see certain themes emerging. So a theme of social status versus profession, theme of social interactions, and theme of propriety are important themes that emerge through chapter 2. Well, coming towards the first theme, that is of social status and profession, I would say a recurring theme in the novel is the relationship between profession and social status. Mr. Weston is below only the Woodhouses and Mr. Knightley is soci in social rank in Highbury, but this was not always the case. Mr. Weston had to climb the social hierarchy. We come to know that he moved from the military up to trade and then finally as the owner of an estate. Other than the nobility, the highest members of British society were people who had owned property and did not have an actual profession. This was the time when uh, landlords, when the owners of estates were considered to be the people of highest rank in the society. And these people, um, apart from owning land and estates, they did not have any profession as such. They didn't have anything to do as professionally. They were not working in any profession. Working, be it in profession, was considered to be a sign of low status. So working as a clergyman or governess or merchant all referred to a low social rank. Um, for your clarity, I would like to say that if you go to the Pakistan, if you go to them, you would see that the Jagheer Dar and the Bade Bade Dar, they practically are not into, into any profession. They do not work in any profession. Um, it is only that they own land and then other people work on those lands and uh, these people enjoy the privileges of being the members of the highest social class. The second theme of um, social interactions also emerges. Um, Social interactions um, is an important issue in the, in the novel. Almost every detail is public. Whatever happens in the course of a novel will reach all of the Highbury society. We see that Frank Churchill's letter to his father is passed from person to person, even reaching the lowest ranked people of the society. Now it is again very typical of what happens in the Pakistani society's, uh, society, um, the rural society, especially nowadays. Exactly that used to happen in the small towns and villages of England at the time of Jane Austen. Everything is known to everybody and nothing is as such private. Rather everything is public. Same was the case in Jane Austen's times. So the novel is set in those times where you see um, at this um, small place that is Highbury, people know, uh, you see, one another very well and uh, nothing is hidden as such about anybody. Frank Churchill's letter is one example of that. The third uh, important theme that emerges is of propriety. Yet another theme emerging in this chapter of the novel is of the importance of propriety. Austen's descriptions of her characters rely on propriety. 
Austin makes only the most general remarks on appearance, but goes into great deal um, details on the manners of each of her characters and whether or not it is proper, such as whether or not Frank Churchill should visit his father soon or not. So you see what is appropriate, what is not in terms of manners, in terms of the manner and mannerism required by a particular social class in that context where they were living. This makes a very important theme. Later on as we would move through the text we would discuss it in detail with reference to what happens. Anyhow, this leads us to chapter 3 of volume 1. This chapter introduces a number of minor characters including the impoverished Mrs. Bates and Miss Bates, her daughter. Mr. Elton, a local clergyman. Mrs. Goddard, the mistress of uh, a boarding school. And most importantly, Harriet Smith, a young girl whom Emma takes under her supervision and protection. Well, uh, Jane Austen as a writer here um, devises her plot in a very, very um, smart way and uh, she wants to introduce another set of characters who would play important role in the upcoming happenings. So what she does is that a logical reason um, of all of them to be introduced is created. Mr. Woodhouse is fond of society among his intimates who visit him on his own terms, especially for evening parties. So in this chapters, George Knightley, the Westons, Mr. Elton, Mrs. Goddard and Mrs. and Miss Bates all are seen visiting him. And through these visits to the father of the female protagonist that is uh, Mr. Woodhouse who is the father of Miss Emma Woodhouse, as these people come to meet him we are introduced to these characters. As far as Miss Bates is concerned, she is a happy woman known for her universal goodwill and contented temper and for being a great talker upon little matters. She chats a lot. Mrs. Goddard runs an honest, old-fashioned and respectable boarding school. It is she who, in order to please Emma, when she asks, brings Harriet Smith for an evening. Emma deems Harriet's acquaintances, farmers by the name of Martin, coarse and inappropriate for Harriet and decides to improve Harriet. And I would say that from this point, as she would take charge of uh, improving Harriet, we would see that the story takes a twist and a turn and we would see it would lead towards a sequence of misunderstandings um, that would be based on Emma's own imagination and her misunderstandings. Continuing Volume 1, Chapter 3, I would say that we are told about Harriet. She is a pretty 17-year-old girl who is the natural daughter of somebody. After Harriet proves to be engaging, proper and deferential, Emma even spends a pleasant evening in forming schemes for doing so. Though simultaneously, she keeps on attending the guests, ensuring that the guests get generous portions of food, in spite of Mr. Woodhouse's concern that they, that they partake of only a little because of health. So what we notice is that while she is being very responsible, that is Emma is being very responsible towards her guests, she attends them as a very good host and uh, uh, ensures that they are served food properly. Actually she is busy mentally and she is planning a scheme to uh, help Harriet improve her personality. The evening ends with Harriet in absolute happiness at the attention she has received from so great a personage in Highbury as Miss Woodhouse. I think this is the appropriate time to read some text about Harriet. So dear students, here is some text from chapter 3 that presents a character sketch of Harriet. Harriet Smith was a natural daughter of somebody. Somebody had placed her several years back at Mrs. Goddard's school and somebody had lately raised her from the condition of scholar to that of parlor boarder. This was all that was generally known of her history. She had no visible friends but what had been acquired at Highbury and was now just returned from a long visit in the country to some young ladies who had been at school there with her. 
she was a very pretty girl and her beauty happened to be a sort which Emma particularly admired. She was short, plump and fair, with a fine bloom, blue eyes, light hair, regular features and a look of great sweetness and before the end of the evening Emma was as much pleased with her manners as her person and quite determined to continue the acquaintance. So it is not only the physical appearance but also the manners of Harriet that attract Emma. The text about Harriet continues. She was not struck by anything remarkable, clev remarkably clever in Miss Smith's conversation, but she found her altogether very engaging. Not inconveniently shy, not unwilling to talk, and yet so far from pushing, showing so proper and becoming a deference, seeming so pleasantly grateful for being admitted to Harfield as to so artlessly impressed by the appearance of everything in so superior a style to what she had been used to, that she must have good sense and deserve encouragement. Encouragement should be given. Now, as a mouthpiece of Emma, this is what Jane Austen tells us that she wants to encourage her and actually in, uh, in encouraging her what she's going to do is she's actually ironically going to take her as inferior and she's going to be superior. Those soft blue eyes and all those natural graces should not be wasted on the inferior society of Highbury and its connections. Inferior society of Highbury, the reference, the thought itself tells how Emma feels about the class distinction. The acquaintance she had already formed were unworthy of her. The friends from whom she had just parted, though very good sort of people, must be doing ha her harm. They were a family of the name of Martin, whom Emma well knew by character as renting a large farm of Mr. Knightley and residing in the parish of Donwell. Very creditably, she believed, she knew Mr. Knightley thought high of them, but they must be coarse and unpolished and very unfit to be the intimates of a girl who wanted only a little more knowledge and elegance to be quite perfect. She would notice her, she would improve her, she would detach her from her bad acquaintance and introduce her into good society. She would form her opinions and her manners. It would be an interesting and certainly a very kind undertaking, highly becoming her own situation in life, her layer and powers. Now Jane Austen as a narrator tells what Emma is thinking. Emma thinks that she would take notice of Harriet, she would improve her, she would detach her from her old acquaintances and friends and she would introduce her into the upper society, into what she calls a good society. And uh, she would improve her manners, her etiquettes, her opinions, she would build everything. And to Emma, it sounds to be a very interesting job that would fit in well into her layer and the, um, the kind of power she enjoys to handle her surroundings and people around her. By reading this text, the part that we have read, and by uh, seeing how Emma perceives um, Harriet's position, there are some points to ponder that emerge. It is ironic to see that Emma Woodhouse, despite her true intentions to help Harriet out, is found to be meddling everything in her life. Later on, we would see how by um, introducing Harriet into the higher class, into the upper society, actually, which ki chal apni bhi bhool gaya. this is what is going to happen to Harriet. She would neither be able to adjust in her real social class where she belongs to, nor she would be able to find her proper space in the upper class. Anyhow, all her attempts to improve Harriet Smith lead towards problems for Harriet. Though she has good intentions towards Harriet and genuinely wishes to help the young lady by introducing her into society and finding her a suitor, Emma automatically thinks the Martins are too common for Harriet. Mr. Knightley, however, thinks very highly of them despite the profession. So class distinction, social status and profession, again the same themes are addressed. This is yet another example of social rank determining the possibility for marriage and courtship. 
Once again, we find that parentage becomes important for determining a character's social status. An important facet of Harriet's character is that she doesn't know who are her family. This is a hindrance in Harriet's assuming a higher social status. So, high birth is very important in attaining high social status. This chapter also sets up the social hierarchy of Highbury society. Um, the Woodhouses, the Westerns and Mr. Knightley at the top since they own the large estates. Below them in status is Mr. Elton who is important in Highbury not because of wealth but because he is a local vicar. Mrs. Bates as the widow of the former vicar also retains some status. And at the lowest rank in the society are single women such as Harriet Smith, Miss Bates, etc. Miss Bates takes part in social functions because of her mother. But the only reason that Harriet is allowed among the high ups of Highbury is Emma. Since Emma is at the top of Highbury society, she enjoys position and power there. She can determine who is to be included or excluded in the gatherings of the high ups of the upper class society. This leads us to the opening text of chapter 4 that I would like to share with you. Harriet Smith's intimacy at Harfield was soon a settled thing. Quick and decided in her ways, Emma lost no time in inviting, encouraging and telling her to come very often. And as their acquaintance increased, so did their satisfaction in each other. As a walking companion, Emma had very easy, early foreseen how useful she might find her. In that respect, Mrs. Weston's loss had been important. Her father never went beyond the shrubbery where two divisions of the grounds sufficed him for his long walk or his short as the years varied. And since Mrs. Weston's marriage, her exercise had been too much confined. She had ventured once alone to Randall's, but it was not pleasant. And a Harriet Smith, therefore, one whom she could summon at any time to a walk would be a valuable addition to her privileges. But in every respect, as she saw more of her, she approved her and was confirmed in all her kind designs. Well, dear students, I would like you to think of it in terms of um, Pakistani rural context where you would see landlords um, and their um, female family members acting and behaving almost in the same way. Just like our friend, any other woman, because they have to live in that limited circle of their lives, so they can't go outside of their values. कन्फाइंड से एक लाइफ होती है तो टू हैव फन इन दैट लाइफ उस जिंदगी को खुशगवार बनाने के लिए वॉक पे जाना है तो कोई साथ हो um, कहीं जरा सा किसी की तरफ जाना है somebody should accompany so all for all those purposes they need somebody from the lower rank किसी मुजारे की बेटी किसी काम करने वाले की बेटी जो उनको अच्छी लगे जो एक सूटेबल पर्सन uh, हो जिसको वो साथ ले जा सकें who would listen to their stories who would obey what they would say and who would act according to their whims same is the case here with Emma and Harriet Emma is pleased to see that um, in the case of lost of Mrs. Weston who would always go with her on walks and all that and now that she's restricted because without Mr. Woodhouse the father she cannot go alone so uh, Harriet can be of um, much use in that context she can take her along and um, she would provide a good company The important happenings that we notice in chapter 4, volume 1 are number 1 that Emma introduces Harriet Smith into her social circle. Number 2, Harriet serves the role of a companion to replace Mrs. Weston. Harriet can tell Emma little about her parents for Mrs. Goddard has told her very little. So the, um, the parentage of Harriet is not known much about. Emma begins to realize that among the Martins there is a son who has a romantic interest in Harriet. Now Emma inquires Harriet about Mr. Martin. She attempts to belittle him as uneducated, not handsome and too young to marry. 
اب بیسکلی تو ایما کو یہ لگ رہا ہوتا ہے نا کہ مارٹن بلونگز ٹو ا کمپیریٹیولی لوور کلاس اینڈ ہیریٹ شوڈ بی گیون ا سوشل اپ لفٹ اینڈ شی شوڈ موو ان ٹو دا اپر کلاس اور اس کی شادی بھی اپر کلاس سے کسی بندے سے ہونی چاہیے تو اس لیے اب وہ ساری خامیاں نکال رہی ہے سارے نقص نکال رہی ہے مارٹن میں اینڈ شی سیز دیٹ ہی از این ان ایجوکیٹڈ ناٹ ہینڈسم اینڈ ٹو یگ ٹو میری kind of a person after Emma briefly meets Mr. Martin she tells Harriet outright that he is remarkably plain and clownish she tells Harriet to compare him to better men such as Mr. Weston or Mr. Elton Emma decides that Mr. Elton would suit Harriet for he did not have low connections but did not have a family who would object to Harriet's doubtful birth so again we notice that Emma is on her way of matchmaking of Harriet with somebody most probably with Mr. Elton through this chapter an important thing that we notice is Emma's role as a godmother Harriet is impressionable and naive and she completely relies upon Emma Harriet reveals herself to be the perfect case for Emma her so-called uh, godmother who would always take care of her and would make decisions for her We also need to notice the juxtaposition in the roles of Harriet and Mrs. Weston. Harriet replaces Mrs. Weston as a companion, but, but unlike Mrs. Weston, she will not criticize Emma or attempt to improve her. She is rather so impressionable that she would try to imitate Emma and would try to flatter her. Actually, dear students, what you need to notice is that throughout the novel, Jane Austen as a writer would be using this technique of characterization. She would always be bringing pairs of characters together. She would be bringing uh, characters in comparison and contrast. And through those comparisons and contrasts, she would be highlighting important traits of the personalities of these characters. So here Harriet and Mrs. Weston are compared. Emma chooses Harriet as a friend precisely because of her difference from Mrs. Weston because Mrs. Weston would always advise and would say this is right or this is wrong. Though we are told in the first chapter that Emma would do whatsoever she would like to but at least Mrs. Weston would give advice that she would think right. In case of Harriet, she is such an impressionable, an impressionable and naive girl that she would just like to copy, to imitate Emma. Since she cannot replace Mrs. Weston, she decides to find, this is about uh, Emma, that she cannot replace Mrs. Weston, she decides to find a different sort of relationship. Instead of finding another teacher, Emma finds a student this time to whom she herself would be offering advice all the time. theme of manners and mannerism is a very strong theme that emerges out of um, all these um, details of this chapter manners are needed for social approval upward social mobility is not possible without adopting the manners of that class the reason that Emma gives to dissuade Harriet Smith from a romance with Robert Martin is significant according to her he lacks proper manners with his awkward look abrupt manner and uncouthness of a voice. She does this through contrast. Robert Martin lacks what Mr. Knightley or Mr. Weston or Mr. Elton have. But for Emma, manners actually mean status. This is what we need to understand. And actually she always relates proper etiquette and manner to a particular class. She disapproves of Robert Martin before she has even met him and only knows that he's a farmer. So just being a farmer is enough to reject him considering that his manners would not be appropriate. This also reinforces the theme of relationship between status and manners. She claims that Mr. Knightley and Mr. Elton have manners that befit their social situation. Each place in society has manners that are proper to it. Behavior that might be acceptable to a woman such as Emma might not be appropriate for a woman such as Harriet Smith or vice versa. Well, so far from chapter 3 and 4, there are some other important points that emerge and I would like to share those. I would like to talk about Jane Austen and her times in comparison with Emma and her times that are presented in the novel. 
Emma, like others around her, obviously believes in the propriety of social stratification and exemplifies it when she leads to um, she leads to believing Harriet to compare Robert Martin with the other gentlemen. However, it is worth remembering that when Emma says, the humanity are precisely the order of people with whom I feel I can have nothing to do. She is not being snobbish in the modern sense. Though it may not be admirable by today's standards, her social conscience is that of the 18th century. And it is, a signific it is significant that her very next remarks coming without pause are these. A degree or two lower and a creditable appearance might interest me. I might hope to be useful to their families in some way or other, but a farmer can need none of my help and is therefore in one sense as much above my notice as in every other he is below it. So anyways, Emma finds um, that uh, she has nothing to do with the kind of people Mr. Martin is. In light of the world around her, Emma's only serious mistake, socially and humanly speaking, is in letting her willful wish and imagination convince her that Harriet, who is so pretty and amiable, that is very friendly, must come from gentility. So it is maybe out of her goodwill for Harriet or whatsoever, but we come to know that she wants Harriet to be settled in the upper class. This leads us to chapter 5 of volume 1 and there are some important happenings in this chapter as well. George Knightley and Mrs. Weston have a discussion, almost an argument about Emma's relation with Harriet. He discusses with Mrs. Weston how he disapproves of Emma's friendship with Harriet Smith. Mrs. Weston believes that it would be good for both of their education, but George Knightley is convinced that nothing good can come out of it for either party. When Mrs. Weston says it will lead to Emma's reading more, his short reply is that Emma has been meaning to read more ever since she was 12 years old and that she will never subject the fancy to the understanding. Mr. Knightley also claims that Harriet will do nothing to stimulate Emma intellectually and will do nothing but flatter her. Mr. Knightley tells Mrs. Weston that her job as a governess prepared her well to be a wife for it trained her to submit her own will. So we notice two, three things about Mr. Knightley uh, through this discussion between Mr. Knightley and Mrs. Weston, that is Miss Taylor, uh, previously. Number one, Mr. Knightley believes that um, Emma should not be friended with Harriet because it would harm both Harriet and Emma. Uh, when um, Mrs. Weston argues that it would uh, add to the education of both. He says that Emma has been reading since she was 12, so anyways it is not going to add anything to her. And it um, also is not going to help her intellectually because uh, all the time uh, Harriet would just be flattering her and would actually not give the right... Um, mm, uh, the right or uh, I would say appropriate suggestions. The third thing that we notice about uh, Mr. Knightley is that he believes that a woman should be prepared and should be ready to submit her own will to her husband and she should be trained for this before she enters into marriage because she, uh, he comments on Mrs. Weston's um, job as a governess that it was this job that prepared Mrs. Weston for her marriage. After he refers ironically to Emma's genius for foretelling and guessing, Mrs. Weston shifts the talk to Emma's beauty, eliciting from him the statement that I love to look at her. Now, a very important thing Emma has always had people around her who would spoil her. There is Mr. Woodhouse, the father, who is very fond of Emma and who would always believe that whatsoever Emma thinks, it takes place, it happens. Whatsoever Emma does is always right. Now this is the second person who has played her role maybe in spoiling Emma or making her think in that way as she thinks. And this is Mrs. Weston. Um, she talks about Emma's beauty, she talks um, about her genius and she uh, always tries to give her extra credit for everything. Mrs. Weston can see no flaw in, in Emma actually and requests and, and advises George not to make an issue of the friendship between Emma and Harriet. 
Well, George is a very agreeable kind of a person. He is very friendly and uh, he does not like to create fuss over things. He takes things lightly. That is why he agrees and in wondering what will become of Emma recalls, she always declares she will never marry. However, Mrs. Weston's reply is a vague one in response to this. So this is the note where the chapter comes to an end. There are some important discussion points with relation to chapter 5. Most importantly, Mr. Knightley serves as the voice of the writer in the novel. So he stands for the voice of reason, of logic and rationality. He presents the author's view on each character. And a lot about Emma and Harriet is told through the mouthpiece of Mr. Knightley. In this chapter, he serves to point out Emma's flaws again. In fact, throughout the novel, we see him doing the same job. From the very outset of the novel, we have started noticing that. Mm, there are some important themes that emerge out of uh, what happens in Chapter 5. Uh, foreshadowing of future relationships and the theme of social class distinction are two important things that I would like to talk about. Well, Mr. Knightley is greatly concerned with Emma's behavior and this interest seems more than just casual and friendly interest and later on towards um, the end of the novel you would see how um, uh, it ends up in developing or establishing a relationship between Mr. Knightley and Emma. Therefore, when Mr. Knightley tells Mrs. Weston and Emma that Harriet Smith is not an appropriate friend for Emma, it becomes important. The harm in the friendship is that Harriet will flatter Emma and would stimulate her worst qualities, while Emma will teach Harriet to be so refined that she will not fit among her true social equals later on. And um, the upcoming chapters would tell us how far um, all these judgments of Mr. Knightley are correct. Again, social status becomes important. Friendship with a woman at the center of Highbury society will only confuse the young girl Harriet and she should consider this factor in the light of her suspicious birth and upbringing. Achha, I am sorry, her do dafa likha hai, ye type of error hai. Mr. Knightley makes an important comment to Emma about how she prepared Mrs. Weston for marriage by making Mrs. Weston submit to Emma's wishes. This highlights the role of a wife in marriage as completely subservient to the husband and indicates how exceptional Emma is in her circumstances where she is a bit too much powerful. Emma, because of her fortune and status, has the different degree of power that she enjoys that is exceptional to her and that generally other women, women around her do not have. Through this chapter, we come to know a bit more about Mr. Knightley's character. He emerges as a realist, as a man of understanding, a rational person, a mature man and a very friendly person as well. He is quite right about Emma, but too friendly or amiable to interpose. His statements about Emma's not reading books is ironical when we recall Emma's recent criticism of Robert Martin for the very same neglect. In stating his view of what a wife should be, George refers to Mrs. Weston's talent for submission of her will, and yet by the end of the chapter it is George himself who has submitted to her. In terms of the development of character of Mrs. Weston, we also come to know um, certain things. Mrs. Weston has absolute innocent faith in her former ward, that is Emma. She in this chapter helps to explain why Emma is as she is. She is blind in her love for Emma and she cannot see her flaws. Her hinted wishes that they at Randall's have for Emma constitute the author's foreshadowing of further plot, plot complications that we would see in the upcoming chapters. This takes us to chapter 6 of volume 1. Emma speaks to Mr. Elton about Harriet Smith, but for every compliment he gives Harriet, Mr. Elton gives Emma the credit. Emma decides to draw a portrait of Harriet Smith for Mr. Elton, even though he seems more interested in having a picture by Emma Woodhouse than of Harriet Smith. While Emma draws uh, Harriet, Mr. Elton fidgets behind her. When Emma completes the picture of Harriet Smith, Mr. Weston and Mr. Knightley note how Emma has improved Harriet's appearance, giving her better features and making her taller. 
When the picture is completed, others find some faults in it, but Mr. Elton is determined to find everything in it exactly right, almost to the point of perfection. When it is decided that the portrait should, um, should be framed because all that it lacks is being framed um, and that it must be done in London, Mr. Elton is happy to take the responsibility. And what we notice is that the theme of self-deception becomes a prominent theme of this chapter. Emma realizes that while doing the picture, she has been the object of many of uh, Elton's compliments, but she assures herself that it is merely his gratitude on Harriet's account. She would remain under this illusion. She would um, have the same, she would suffer the same self-deception for quite long a time in the novel and it would leave towards a lot of pain that she would have to suffer as a consequence. Anyhow, Mr. Elton takes the picture to London so that it can be framed. Well, with reference to chapter 6, a very important discussion point is the situational irony. Harriet Smith is interested in Mr. Elton, but Mr. Elton is interested in Emma, the woman who is attempting to set up the two. It also creates a number of ambiguities. Mr. Elton gladly accepts the portrait, but is not clear whether or not he cherishes it for the subject, that is the, uh, that is the young girl Harriet, of whose picture it is made, or the artist, that is Emma. Certain qualities in both Emma and Harriet Smith allow this delusion to continue. Emma has idealized both Harriet and Mr. Elton in her attempts to play matchmaker. She cannot presume that her plans would ever go wrong. Harriet, on the other hand, relies on Emma so much and is so trusting that she cannot see the signals that Mr. Elton gives. So there is a lot of confusion on the part of all the three persons involved. And I would say that this confusion continues for quite a long time in the novel. A very important theme um, uh, that has not yet been discussed in detail emerges in this chapter and that is the theme of life of layer. The chapter reinforces the life of layer that Emma Woodhouse lives. Uske zindagi mein maze hai, usko kuch karna nahi hai. She wants to spend time. So to spend her days working on a portrait of Harriet Smith, this is what she does the maximum. Yet also interesting is that the others also have a similar life of layer. Or ye sirf Emma Woodhouse hi nahi hai, baaki sab ki zindagi, those who belong to the upper class, wo maze mein guzar rahi hai, they don't have anything to do. Even though Harriet does not have Emma's resources and Mr. Elton actually has a career, we find them spending a lot of time on this portrait making activity. Interestingly, Austin never shows Mr. Elton actually at work or performing his duties at the parish. We are told that he is the vicar. This takes us to chapter 7 of volume 1. On the very day of Mr. Elton's going to London, Harriet receives a letter with a direct proposal of marriage from Robert Martin. Although Emma finds that the letter containing the proposal is better than she expected, she speaks against him in front of Harriet. Ab do baat hai yahan important hai. One, that um, Emma did not expect that good a letter from Martin. Well, this shows snobbery on the part of Emma. This also... Um, shows that whatsoever she perceives about Martin may not, not be right. Anyhow, she speaks against him in front of Harriet because at, at the end of the day, she doesn't want Harriet to marry him. She even goes to the extent of claiming that the letter must be written by one of his sisters. This is very ironic, by the way. When Harriet asks her point blank what she should do, Emma discourages Harriet from accepting the proposal claiming that a woman should always say no if there is even the slightest doubt. Harriet is disappointed, and this is important for us to notice, that Harriet is disappointed to turn Mr. Martin down, but she follows what Emma says. Emma manages to distract her by talking about Mr. Elton and the portrait he is uh, taking to London. Emma also talks uh, to her to think of Mr. Elton instead of Martin, that how in London he is getting her portrait, Framed. So she wants to shift the attention of Harriet from Mr. Martin to Mr. Elton. 
Well, the points to ponder from uh, this chapter are, number one, Emma's idea that one of Martin's sisters wrote the letter is absurd on various grounds. It is absurd on the various grounds, firstly because in the times of Jane Austen and in the times in which the novel Emma is set um, in England, generally women would be far less educated than men. So Martin's sisters are supposed to be less educated than Martin. So it appears to be very strange that she would write a letter for him. For Emma it is not Robert Martin's manners but his status that is actually important. Character of Harriet um, when it comes to the important traits of Harriet that emerge through the chapter they are that she is dependent on Emma. She is indecisive. She cannot decide whether or not to marry Robert Martin without asking Emma. Harriet Smith asks Emma her opinion on the proposal when Harriet obviously has her own opinion on the matter. We can notice her disappointment. She has some doubt but is so obviously disappointed when Emma advises her to reject Martin's proposal that it is clear she wishes to marry him. Still, Harriet does not have the courage to oppose Emma's opinion. So she is just like a puppet in the hands of Emma. And according to her own whim and the way it pleases her, Emma moves the strings of this puppet. Dear students, this leads us to chapter 8 of volume 1, that is the last chapter of our today's session. Since Harriet now has a bedroom at the Woodhouses and she often stays there, now she sleeps at Halffield this night as well. The next morning when she is away at Mrs. Goddard's, George Knightley calls and talks with Emma. Mr. Knightley credits her with improving Harriet, curing her of her schoolgirl temperament. Then he hints that Harriet can expect a proposal from Robert Martin, who has consulted George and whom George praises strongly for his qualities. But when Emma reveals that Robert has already written a letter and uh, that he has been refused by Harriet, Mr. Knightley, that is George Knightley, he is very furious, he is very angry, thinking that Harriet is a simpleton for refusing. He thinks it is very inappropriate on the part of Harriet to refuse. He guesses that Mr. Elton is the object of Emma's intrigue and assures her that it will not work. Again, we can see the imagination of Emma at work on one hand and the rationality of Mr. Knightley, George Knightley on the other hand. Anyhow, Emma thanks him for his advice and he leaves abruptly. When Harriet returns, she talks of nothing but Mr. Elton, who she has come to know is actually on his road to London with the portrait. Well, as keen readers, we need to notice a few things um, with reference to this chapter. Harriet as a constant guest at Harfield generates some ideas about the theme of misconception that would lead um, to the later on happenings. Harriet may think of herself as a resident of Harfield, uh, which would obviously accord her greater status than she deserves and it would lead towards disappointment later on for Harriet. Mr. Knightley's rationality is going to be true in this case. Harriet would assume herself as too high in status for Mr. Knightley. The best of example of this is that Harriet turned down the proposal of Mr. Robert Martin. As Mr. Knightley serves as Austen's voice of reason in the novel, this makes it clear that because of Emma, Harriet has made a mistake. Well, some other points to ponder with reference to chapter 8 are with reference to the social class and marriage theme. Again, class is the primary consideration for marriage. Harriet is poor. She does not know her parentage, so she is unlikely to marry well. She also needs to take care that her marriage and her husband provide her a social standing. Emma's great fault is making Harriet Smith believe that she can expect a man of higher status than she can actually claim. And uh, disillusionment on the part of Harriet would take a long way to go. When Mr. Knightley and Emma discuss Harriet's possibilities for marriage, they specifically do not mention love. It is the social class and marriage that are interrelated. Love as such has nothing to do with the issue of marriage. For the characters in the novel, the primary consideration is marrying for status and for social security, not for any great romantic considerations as it happens most of the times in other novels. 
Well, these are the materials that I have taken and incorporated, and this is the summary of the session that I would like to share before I close today's session. In this session, we covered eight chapters of Volume 1, that is from Chapter 1 to 8. Important happenings in these chapters were covered, and uh, critical points of discussion were raised. Important parts of text with reference to the development of characters, plot, and structure were discussed. I also discussed Jane Austen as a writer and her art of characterization. Uh, I also talked about how by comparing and contrasting characters, he presents different traits of the characters that she presents. Development of different themes through these chapters uh, were discussed and uh, their relation to the development of plot and structure was also seen. With this, I bring this to an end. Thank you very much.